All right, team, we have a very important mission. The date was August 15th, 1944. The location, over enemy territory, Germany. The mission, bombing enemy infrastructure, including railroads and airfields. This is a B-17 Flying Fortress, named the Flying Bison. The B-17 was an American bomber. It carried a payload of over 4,000 pounds of bombs. The problem with this bomber and all bombers is that they were big, and slow, and loud. German fighters and anti-aircraft guns wreaked havoc with the bombers. Flak, or anti-aircraft fire, was a nightmare that affected almost every bomber in World War II. These were rounds that would explode near a bomber, throwing pieces of shrapnel at them. Bombers could take evasive maneuvers, but at times it was so thick, they just had to fly through it. To combat the enemy fighters, the B-17 had nine machine gun positions. These bombers often flew in large groups that were escorted by American fighter planes, like the P-51 Mustang. This is the same type of plane flown by the famed Tuskegee Airmen, African-American fighter pilots who escorted bombers during World War II. Your mission is to tell the story of the Flying Bison. How much time do we have, sir? About 30 minutes. When's wheels up? Right now. This is STEM in 30. Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, and we're in the World War II Gallery at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., coming to you today live. And I'm Beth. Uh, we want to start by welcoming our online audience and our NASA TV audience, and we want to remind you that you can submit questions during the broadcast. We may take them live. If not, we have an expert standing by to answer them. This gallery is incredible. It's filled with World War II airplanes, like this Japanese Zero that you see behind me. Now, this is the same type of plane that the Japanese used to bomb Pearl Harbor, which brought the United States into World War II. The one we have here, we believe, was captured in 1944 on Saipan Island. It was brought to the United States, studied, and then eventually turned over to the Smithsonian. Now, one of the things you notice as soon as you walk into this gallery is this large mirror on the back wall. The name of the painting is Fortress Under Fire. And now I have some friends from Jefferson Middle School Academy. Um, we're going to take a look at this uh, mural. What do you see when you first look at this mural? I see, like, airplanes and I see a Germany airplane try to attack the other airplane. Okay, and what do you think is going on in this? Um, I see that World War II has um, already begun and it's already still going because as you see the um, the little plane right there is just Tuskegee people. They actually use flying small planes and um, over there that one plane right there is the leader because of the other two planes on the bottom and as you see it's still going because you can see the smoke in the corner. Okay, uh, what do you see in this big plane? What it catches your eyes? Well, what I see is a whole bunch of machine guns and that tells me that it's most likely to be protected and it's real slow with why they have so many machine guns just protected. Okay, uh, those are very good observations. Now to learn more about this uh, mural, let's go down to uh, Marty. Thanks, Beth. We are joined today by Dr. Dr. Jeremy Kinney. Thank you so much for joining us. Glad You're a curator here. here at the National Air and Space mm -hmm. Museum. Now, you've got something really interesting you want to tell us about this mural, right? The painting that you see here is depicting an actual mission from August 15, 1944, in which the 303rd Bomb Group, the Hells Angels, are attacking this German airfield near Wiesbaden, Germany. Now, how many bombers went out on this raid? 39 from the 303rd. Did 39 bombers return from this raid? No, nine did not return from the mission. All right, so today we're gonna to learn about one of those bombers, the Flying Bison. We're gonna learn all about its story and we're gonna find out at the end of the show if it made it back or not. 
But before we get started on that, I want to know a little bit more about bombers. Can you tell us about bombers and their different purposes? Well, the ability to carry a bomb to the target is the main offensive capability of an Air Force. And so you have large four-engine bombers like the B-17 and B-24, but also you have Navy dive bombers and torpedo bombers attacking ships on the open ocean. And they all served a different purpose, right? That's right. It's all to destroy something, but the idea is to deliver that bomb to the target. Okay, and there were different positions on the bomber, right? Yeah, on a B-17 you have ten, a 10-man ten crew, and you have members of the crew dedicated to getting the, the bomber there, to piloting it, as well as communicating to the base back home and to other aircraft. And then you have members that are just there in a defensive capability, operating the machine guns to protect the bomber. And it seems like every member of that crew had a really important job. That's right, it's a combat team in this bomber. Now we've got a really special bomber in our collection, not here, but at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center called Flakbait. Can you tell us about it? Flakbait is a B-26 Marauder that flying over Europe flew the most missions of any American combat airplane during World War II, over 200. Wow, and based on the name Flakbait, I'm guessing it didn't come through unscathed. That's right, you can look at the bomber today and see over a thousand patched holes from combat. Now that tells me that the, the, not only the flight crew, but also the ground crew was really important. That's right, you know, combat aircraft aren't meant to survive, but that's what Flak Bay did. It survived more than any other combat airplane for the United States. Wow. Were well, you ready to take a couple questions? Yes. All right, let's go to an online question first. How many people did it take to fly a B-17 bomber? Well, there's a 10-man crew. And so you have the pilot and the co-pilot who are you know, operating the bomber, just flying it. You have the bombardier who's actually going to aim the bombs. The navigator is going to direct the bomber to the target. The radio man who's going to communicate. The flight engineer is going to make sure all the systems work. And then you have the rest, these gunners, who are just there to protect the bomber in the sky. Wow. And, and the, the bombardier actually didn't drop it when, he were right, when they were right over the target, did he? No, you, you have this analog computer, the bomb site. And that, you have to have wind distance, velocity, altitude, and that's all calculated. So usually the bombers are a little bit farther away to, to make adjustments for that. Awesome. All right, we've got an audience question. Come on up. Come on up here. My name is Damar Roberts, and my first question is, what plane had the biggest impact in World War II? Well, it's a really good question because, you know, it depends on what type of uh, use the airplane was. But we talk about bombers, probably the B-17 and the B-24 would be the important because of their strategic function in terms of bringing the war to Nazi Germany in which before the D-Day invasion, you didn't have any allied presence in Northern Europe. So these bombers are waging war on the Germans. All right, let's check out a video question. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan and my question is what kind of targets and how accurate were the bombers during World War II? A strategic bomber like the B-17 would attack factories. It would attack uh, places beyond the battle lines to affect an outcome on the war, to you know, bring the enemies, you know, bring them to the, the negotiation table to end the war. And so they would use these analog computers, bomb sites, to aim at a target. It was learned they weren't as accurate when you were being shot at, when you have different altitudes and different weather. And so you'd have a lead bombardier and a lead aircraft. And when they, that airplane dropped its bombs, the rest of the group would drop their bombs as well. So you have a large path of bombs that are falling on the target then. Probably a lot of destruction there. Yes. All right. Well, Beth is joined by our next guest, Dr. Tom Crouch. Beth? Hi, Tom. Thanks so much for being with us today. Not a problem, Beth. Now, I understand that the National Air and Space Museum has a very interesting connection with the U.S. Navy. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? It does. The connection with the U.S. Navy in World War II and it's a person, Paul Edward Garber, who was really the founder of this museum. He went to work for the Smithsonian in 1920, and he was still coming to work once in a while in 1992 when he passed away. And when you come to the museum, an awful lot of the airplanes that you see were airplanes, even now, that Paul Garber collected. Now, Paul Garber had an interesting connection to World War II in kite making, I understand. When World War II began, Paul, who uh, was a model builder, uh, went to work for the Navy. Eventually, he became a lieutenant commander in the Navy. And his first job was to develop a program to build little recognition models of airplanes so that people all over the country would be able to tell an enemy airplane from a friendly airplane. But 
Down at the Washington Navy Yard one day, he heard Admiral John Towers talk about how difficult it was uh, for any aircraft gunners to get accurate. And he thought about that for a while. Paul was not only a model builder, he was a kite builder too, from the time he was a very little boy. And it seemed to him that he ought to be able to develop a kite that you could maneuver so you could fly it like from the back end of a ship and make it dodge and weave and climb and loop and give the any aircraft gunners practice. And in fact, originally they, they built six to try the idea out. And by the end of the war, they had built 300,000 kites. Um, the Navy, you just use lots of them. And Paul actually went into the Pacific uh, to work with the kites. And one of his favorite stories was about in the South Pacific, a gun crew, uh, they were flying a kite and taking car target practice and so on when Japanese aircraft attacked. And Paul said all they had to do was go from the target kite to the enemy airplanes and it worked just really well. So um, a great story. Yeah, that's a really interesting story. Um, should we take some questions? You bet. Okay, let's start with an online question. Why was it called the U.S. Army Air Forces in World War II, but the U.S. Air Force today? Well, as the title says, the U.S. Army Air Forces were part of the Army during World War II. They were a branch of the Army. But after World War II, in 1947, the President and Congress created an independent Air Force, the U.S. Air Force. So that's why the name change. Okay, let's take an audience question. My name is Bernadette Kenner, and my question is, how are World War II kites like kites we fly today? How are World War II kites like kites we fly today? Well, the, the World War II kites that Paul Garber developed were a little different. Today, we can fly really sophisticated kites that you can make do all kinds of gyrations in the sky. But in the 1930s and 40s, those kind of kites hadn't been designed yet. So what Paul had to do was develop this big harness system and he had special rudders and other controls on the kite that he could control from the ground. So when the kite was in the air, he could make them do all kinds of things. So it was kind of like one of the first trick kites. It was one of the first trick kites, you bet. Okay, now we've been talking about the flying bison, which was, as you know, uh, a bomber. And they were big and loud and slow. So Tom, was the flying bison ever a attacked by German fire? No, oh, it sure was, Beth. If you look at the mural, the flying bison is in that group of airplanes. And you can see the enemy fighters coming in on them. And you can see the little black spots. That's any aircraft fire, flak, uh, the pilots called it. So you bet those guys were under fire. But they had little planes, little fighters that were helping them out too. Let's, to hear more about that, let's uh, go back to uh, Marty and Jeremy. So the flying bison was attacked by German aircraft. What happened? The bison is a target for the German fighters. And they make a run past the bison and it just perforates the fuselage with shells in which Roy Hughes, one of the waste gunners, dies. You have the tail gunner and the radio operator wounded. And so that pretty much disables the airplane. It can't keep up with the rest of the bomber formation so it flies a little bit lower and slows down. And so it's been a target for these fighters. Wow. Now Bombers were big targets, so how did we combat that? How, how did we keep these German fighters from really tearing us up more? The key to resisting German fighters was to introduce an American fighter capable of flying with the bombers all the way to the target deep in the Nazi Germany. So the P-51 Mustang becomes this very important war-winning weapon for the American Air Forces. And th this is a P-51 right that's behind right, us. That's right, it's a Mustang right there. And that seems like that's the favorite plane of a lot of these pilots. Yeah, it's a preeminent you know, dogfighter, it, can, it has the range, and in a lot of ways in the eyes of the pilots they, and, the, and the air crew, they see this as a 
this is a protection for them. This is, this is going to keep them safe and get them back to base and back home in the long run. Now, there was a very special group of, of African-American pilots that flew these P-51 Mustangs. Can you tell us about them? Yeah, the 332nd Fighter Group, part of the 15th Air Force flying out of Italy, was the first African-American combat aviation group. And so you have these pilots that are flying escort for B-20, B-24s and B-17s, and so they are protecting these bombers and they're performing their job very well. Awesome. Well, recently I had an opportunity to sit down with one of the original Tuskegee Airmen, Charles McGee. Check this out. I am joined today by Colonel Charles McGee, one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. It is such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Now, thank you were awarded, and I just messed this up a minute ago, but you were awarded the... Legion of Merit. Legion of Merit, the Distinguished okay. Flying Cross, yes. the Bronze Star, uh, mm -hmm. and a Congressional Gold Medal. Yes. Now, Two. you flew over 400 combat missions in... Yeah, indeed, 409, because I was still on board uh, after World War II, then Korea, and then Vietnam. And you flew a ton of different airplanes. Did you have a favorite? Oh, yeah, it's going to fighter pilot. It's going to be the P-51 Mustang, but you got to qualify with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Now, your main role during World War II was as a bomber escort, correct? That's correct. Our bombers, of course, destroying Germany's war-making potential, but they thought we had enough guns on the B-17s and B-24s to protect them. Not so against the German Air Force. Some of the early missions, they were losing half of a squadron, and that's 10 crewmen to an airplane lost. How did the bomber crews react to you guys um, as their escorts? Well, earlier, they, in fact, many didn't know throughout the war that the then red-tailed P-51s were black pilots. Were they surprised? Some were surprised and some very happy because, uh, in, as I say, in their escort work, we did follow our leader's admonishment, stick with the bombers, and uh, so we've gotten a slap on the back and a thank you. Now, did you ever have any scary moments while you were flying escorts for bombers? Well, I, I put it this way. I'm, I'm often asked that by youngsters. I say, not scary. Some moments to get your adrenaline up. I say, if you're scared, you're in the wrong business, <laughs> for, for sure. Now, you probably face some challenges going towards becoming a pilot. What, would, what advice would you give to middle school students that are facing challenges? Dream your dreams, but prepare. Find out what your talents are. Get a good education. You know, I, I always say, learn to read, write, and speak well, but also develop the talents and skills that you have. Let excellence be your goal in everything that, that, that you do. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. Well, my pleasure indeed. Thank you for having me. I have a challenge for our studio audience and those of you watching online and on NASA TV. You guys all have recording devices that you keep in your pockets. Now, a big chunk of our crew has family members that served in, in World War II. You'll see some images here. That's my grandfather on the right. Um, and Jeremy, you had some family that served in World War yeah, II as well. Yeah, both my grandfather served. Mm -hmm. And my challenge to you guys is to record an oral history with a veteran. Um, we're losing our World War II veterans at an alarming rate and you guys have the capabilities to record their stories so that they don't get lost. So I challenge you, go find a veteran, whether it be a World War II veteran or whether it be a veteran from another conflict or any veteran, and ask them some stories. We've posted on our website some resources to help you tell some oral histories and to record some oral histories. So go talk to a veteran and record those, and we'd love to hear about it here at STEM and 30. Now, over the last year, I've had an opportunity to talk to quite a few World War II veterans, and they have some absolutely amazing stories. And the next story you're gonna hear is from Joe Murchison. He was a member of the Triple Nickels. These were African-American paratroopers that were trained as smoke jumpers during World War II. And this story blows me away. Check it out. Were you ever scared when you were jumping out of an airplane? Yes, uh, twice, every jump. <laughs> and what were those two times? Those two times is when I went out the door, and the second time was when I got close to the ground. Now, how many jumps did you end up with? 286. Wow. 286 jumps. Were there any interesting stories with any of those jumps? 
uh, one jump, and I don't have no idea which one it was. I just know it was at Fort Bragg, and we were making a mass jump. And, of course, I went out the lead jump on one door. Uh, I heard somebody yelling, slip, slip. And uh, I looked down, and there was a chute just below me. The, the paratrooper on that chute had seen me. I didn't see, I hadn't seen him. So I pulled down on my rear risers to slip to the rear. And all I did was dump my chute and drop on, the, on top of his chute on the canopy. We were trained that if you landed on anybody else's chute to get off and activate your reserve chute. Uh, honestly, I took a couple steps and my legs were going down into the chute that I was standing on. And about that time, my main parachute started covering me up. And I figured this is no time to get off because if I go off now and pull my reserve, it'll entangle and I'm gone. So I laid down. My excuse for the people around who I laid down is so I wouldn't fall off. So you were on top of his parachute? Laying down and my chute was swirled on top of me. And he was, I could hear him yelling, get off, get off. But uh, I didn't answer, but I wasn't going anywhere. When he did, did his parachute landing fall, his chute collapsed, and I went the last 28 feet by myself. I uh, landed and just knocked all the wind out of me. My eyes were open. I could see people running around, and I could hear them talking, saying, you all right, you all right? And I couldn't move a muscle and couldn't say a word. So after a, a few moments, I guess, uh, I was able to get up and stagger around in the circle and get tangled up in my own harness and fall over, and then I was all right. Absolutely amazing. He rode the other guy's parachute yeah. down. Just mind-boggling. Mind now, now is time for my favorite part of the show, and that is Stim It to Win It. Marty, what are you doing up here on the roof? I'm doing a little plane spotting. What's plane spotting? So in a few minutes, there's going to be a flyover of over 50 World War II era airplanes coming over the National Mall in celebration of the 70th anniversary of VE Day or the Victory in Europe Day. So I'm trying to pick out some of the planes as they come over. Well, why would you want to do that? So during World War II, there was a program called Eyes Aloft where they actually trained people to look for different types of airplanes to know if they needed to take cover or not. So I'm just trying it out. Oh, do you have some for me? Can I sure. give it a try? Let's see, there's some planes coming right now. So I am now joined by our three plane spotters, Tehran, DeAndre, and Bernie. Now, this is what's going to happen. We're going to show you a plane. You're going to watch a video. When the video is over, if you think you know what it is, push the button and have your card ready. Are you ready to watch the first video? Yeah. Yep, okay, let's watch the first one. Okay, Teron, you were quick on that. Which one do you think it is? Is it the Catalina? Okay, but show us your card, let's see. All right, let's see what our, uh, uh, our in-house audience says. Now, our online audience thought it was one of the bombers, one of the flying fortresses. So we've got three different answers. What's the right one, gentlemen? So which one was it, guys? It's a P-51 Mustang. You Just like the plane was. we have right here. Outstanding. Beth, you got another one for us? Yeah, we do. Are you guys ready to watch the next one? Yeah. All right, pay attention. Tehran is fast. Okay, what do you have? It is the Flying Fortress. It's the B-17 uh, Flying Fortress. Our online audience thinks it's the B-17 Flying Fortress. Our in-house audience thinks, thinks it's the B-17 Flying Fortress. Gentlemen, what is it? Well, guys, they all think it's a B-17. Is it? 
They've got it right. Nice. It's got a pretty distinctive outline, doesn't That's it? That's right. Four engines and a big tail. Nice. That's how you tell that. All right. Well, great job, guys. All of you did a great job with that. Now we want to talk about a couple of books that we recommend. Um, the first one I want to point out is Operation Firefly. This is based on the true story of the Triple Nickels, and it's an incredible story. Tom, you want to tell us a little bit about it? No, I agree. It's a really good book, guys. I mean, you saw a veteran of the Triple Nickels on TV. Uh, telling his story, and this book's full of exciting stories like that. Okay, and Jeremy, you want to tell us about Black Wings? This is a book by one of our curators, Von Harsey, and it talks about African Americans in flight from the very early days until the present. So it really talks about the civilian military experience for African Americans in aviation. And it's got some great images in it that help tell that story. Yeah. I, I, I really like both of these books, and I encourage you guys to read them. All right, you guys ready for some questions? Sure. You bet. All right, let's start with an online question. What impact did the Tuskegee Airmen have on today's military? Well, the Tuskegee Airmen are the, the first really important example of African Americans in aviation in the military sense, of being pilots uh, operating in this wide global front, especially in Italy, where they're flying out of. So that experience builds upon the previous experience of African Americans in the military, but then really leads at a very direct path into greater participation by African Americans in the American military. Awesome. All right, let's check out a video question. My name is Emily Tobin, and my question is, how did the Tuskegee Airmen, what was the impact of it in today's sense, knowing all the things and the accomplishments they had, how does it directly impact today's military? Well, in terms of African-American participation in the military, these are the first you know, to do this in aviation. And the idea of being able to be a part of a combat team, to be in the, the modern Air Force, and it sets the, the, the way for African Americans for greater participation, especially in later conflicts like Korea and Vietnam. After all, fighter pilots were the military heroes at the time, if you were a fighter pilot. And here were these guys who made it to the very top of that, that pyramid. That's yeah, a really, stunning achievement. Real for them. American heroes. Great question. All right, we've got an audience question next. Come on up. Hi, my name is Joshua Keaton, and my question is, what modifications did the plane, did they make on the planes from the planes from World War I to World War II? So what modifications happened to the planes between World War I and World War II? Well, when you look at World War I airplanes, they're mostly biplanes with two wings, and they're built out of wood and wire and fabric and that kind of thing. Between World War I and World War II, there was just a revolutionary change. People started building airplanes out of metal instead of wood. They got larger, engines improved. So, I mean, you've got a whole new generation in, uh, in World War II. Great, good question. All right. Thank you. So we've learned all about the flying bison today. Did it make it back to base? The flying bison made it back to Molesworth, England, its base. But, you know, you have injured crew, you have a dead crew member, and so they have to take it slow. So they're being escorted by friendly fighters, and then they make it to the airfield, and they have to circle the airfield, you know, people on the ground, what is, you know, what's the damage here? And when they eventually, then they learn that both tires are blown out, the airplane is so wrecked it'll never fly again, so they scrap the flying bison after this mission. But it did land, and the remaining crew members made it off safely. That's correct, they made it home. What an incredible story. Well. I want to thank you guys for joining us today. This has been great. I want to thank our sponsor, Saffron, for sponsoring the show today and encourage everyone to join us next month as we head out to the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center and check out the SR-71 Blackbird. Hi, I'm Marty Kelsey, one of the hosts of STEM and 30, and check this out. This is the SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest jet-powered aircraft ever built. It made it from LA to DC in an hour and four minutes. That's over 2,000 miles per hour or three times the speed of sound. If you think this is cool, check out STEM in 30. Thanks everybody for watching. Don't forget to submit questions next month as we talk about the SR-71 Blackbird. See you then.